I'm Dr. Jack Kevorkian, licensed uh, doctor in Michigan. Do you want to go on? No, I don't want to go on. You don't want to go on living? I don't. A school teacher named Janet Atkins has triggered a national debate in the way she chose to die. He was known as Dr. Death. And for much of the 1990s, the world was fascinated with Dr. Jack Kevorkian and his homemade suicide machine. It's really the way executions are carried out by lethal injection, except this is self-execution. To take someone and wire them up to a machine, to me, that is very clearly an act of killing. Although he created a public spectacle. There's no law here. Kevorkian focused attention on an important question, one that Americans still struggle with today. What should doctors do when suffering patients want to die? We should address what would give them purpose, not give them a handful of pills. I'm not ashamed to attach my name to what I think is a right that should belong to all terminally ill Americans. This is the suicide machine. All Janet Atkins had to do was push a button and lethal chemicals started flowing. Dr. Kevorkian said he took Mrs. Atkins to this park in a van with the machine inside. The first time Kevorkian used his machine was on a 54-year-old Alzheimer's patient, Janet Atkins. She was conscious of what she wanted to do. She understood that she wanted to die. She wanted to end her life. He was clever enough to develop this so-called suicide machine. The delivery mechanism was an artifice at that time to, to avoid the charge of murder. The patient starts this machine himself or herself? Yes, through pushing the button on the side. The doctor who invented a suicide machine has been charged with first degree murder. His lawyer, Jeffrey Figer, said to the district judge, Michigan has laws against murder. It's illegal to kill yourself, but it's not, there's nothing against assisted suicide. And the judge scratched his head and said, oh yeah, you're right. And that was that. We're here to discuss uh, the wishes of Sherry Miller. Kevorkian continued helping people die, and Michigan continued trying to stop him. We were opposed by the prosecutor, the governor, the legislature, the police, and the churches. They did everything they could to get him. Eventually, the state outlawed assisted suicide. Hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back no more. People versus Jack Kevorkian. Kevorkian tested the new law almost immediately. Prosecutors offered their evidence. Kevorkian admitting on videotape how he helped 30-year-old Thomas Hyde commit suicide. He videotaped his patients, and when you saw these videos, you really had no doubt about how the outcome was going to be because these people were so compelling. Watching the video, some jurors cried. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jack Kevorkian, not guilty. In all, Jack Kevorkian faced four trials for assisted suicide. Not guilty. But was never convicted. At that point, there was a tacit understanding to leave Dr. Kevorkian alone. We had won. I am doing what a physician is supposed to do. There are many patients that nobody knows about, hundreds of patients. But Jack wouldn't leave well enough alone. Kevorkian wanted to ratchet the debate up a notch from assisted suicide to euthanasia. Tom, do you want to go ahead with this? He said, I've done euthanasia and I've videotaped it. How I get the widest possible audience. Lessenberry called CBS's Mike Wallace, who interviewed Kevorkian and played the video on 60 Minutes. Is he dead now? Uh, well, he's dying now, because his oxygen's cut off, he can't breathe. So I'll now quickly inject the potassium chloride to stop the heart. He's dead? Yep, the heart is stopped. The suicide machine and injections are the same thing. Who cares if the patient pushed the button or Kevorkian? And Kevorkian was tired of that artifice, so he wanted to amp it up. I thought he was an evil character. It really wasn't about optimal care for the patient. It was about Jack Kevorkian making a big statement about what he wanted the country to do. Michigan prosecutors today charged Kevorkian with premeditated murder. This time, he was convicted and went to prison for eight years. You had the audacity to go on national television, show the world what you did, 
and dare the legal system to stop you. Well, sir, consider yourself stopped. He got a national debate going, which I think he then helped stifle by his own outrageous actions. To get America's attention, you've got to be in your face, and Kevorkian was very much in your face. There was a lot of discussion about if Kevorkian's crazy, does this mean that these kinds of acts are all crazy, or might there be a place for this in medicine? Rochester, New York internist Timothy Quill knows firsthand the wrenching decisions doctors make in the face of death. I think it goes on much more commonly than anyone would openly acknowledge. Just months after Kevorkian's first case, in an effort to broaden the debate, Dr. Timothy Quill published an article in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was the first time a mainstream physician had publicly confessed to helping a patient take her own life. I had had this remarkable experience with a patient named Diane who I had helped uh, to die after a long uh, uh, medical adventure. But I did finally agree that I would provide the medication. But Quill took a risk because in New York State, assisted suicide was against the law. I waived my Fifth Amendment rights and testified before the grand jury because I really felt if they heard the story and, and met me that I'd be so different from most everything else they were seeing that it would be hard to believe that they would prosecute. There is no basis for criminal liability against Dr. Quill. It provoked a discussion. There was, as you might expect, a divide in the medical community about whether this was the right thing to do, this was the wrong thing to do. Those opposed to legalization worried that patients would be pressured to prematurely take their lives. I think the people who potentially get abused by legalization are people who might be seen to be a burden on their family, who might have less good uh, situations, less stable situations. We're not dead yet! We want to live! In 1997, Dr. Quill took the debate to the U.S. Supreme Court. We all agree with the need for good pain relief, but we also have to address the question of what to do when that care fails. We would create a societally imposed duty to die so that the terminally ill and the elderly and the disabled would begin to feel guilty if they did not get out of the way. We lost nine to nothing, but there was a lot of stuff that came out of that Supreme Court decision that moved the practice of palliative care forward a, a lot. In its ruling, the court made clear that even though doctors could not intentionally end patients' lives, they could prescribe as much pain medication as needed. Doctors can give patients drugs to relieve their pain, knowing those drugs could hasten death. While the issue was moving through the courts, attention turned to states that were attempting to put aid in dying bills on the ballot. Barbara Coombs Lee wrote the measure that went to Oregon voters in 1994. The argument that we made was people who are dying, who are mentally competent, who have unbearable suffering, should be able to ask their doctor for life any medication. Their bill would allow doctors to prescribe lethal medication to terminally ill patients, but not to administer it themselves. It also required waiting periods, second opinions, and that patients have less than six months to live. Are we gonna have people moving here so they can kill themselves? If you have this as an exit, a solution, then you might not attend to adequate care for people who are dying. Some worry that legalizing aid in dying could lead to worse treatment for patients at the end of life. I just don't think that when a patient says, my life isn't worth it, that the right response is, here's a packet of pills. I think the right response is to explore to them what can give their life meaning in this crucial part of the end of their life. A first-in-the-nation measure that legalizes doctor-assisted suicide. I think everyone was pretty surprised in election night, 1994, when we won. In 1997, after numerous legal challenges, the law, called the Oregon Death with Dignity Act, went into effect. Hello? Dr. Quill still specializes in palliative care, relieving suffering, often at the end of life. So, how are you doing right now? I'm doing very, very well, fine. Pain seems to be managed quite well. 
He says care for patients who are in pain has improved dramatically as a result of the assisted suicide debates of the 1990s. Things like heavy sedation came out of that discussion. You know, that was not available 20 years ago. If pain gets really bad or things really are really bad, that we can be very aggressive with yes. managing your pain. Now we have options that were not there that are legally accepted. But some patients still suffer, like 54-year-old Michael Morasco, whose cancer has spread to his bones. It's very intolerable. You're doing this, just making me comfortable, prolonging the inevitable, and that's not the way I want to go. Morasco wants Dr. Quill to help him die. Just say goodbye to your loved ones, take a shot, go to sleep, and not wake up. Yeah. And, and it should be my right. In New York, as in most states, it is not. You're listening to The Diane Ream Show. Last spring, in Maryland, John Ream, husband of radio personality Diane Ream, was several years into a long decline from Parkinson's disease. He announced to the doctor, I am ready to die. I can no longer use my hands. I can no longer feed myself. I can no longer stand or walk without assistance. The doctor said, I cannot help you die. The only way that you can do this is to stop taking medication, stop drinking water, and stop eating. John said, well, I don't want to starve myself. But like many other patients facing the same dilemma, he did. It took 10 days. He should have been able to choose how he died. Only five states allow doctors to help patients die. There's your merchandise. There's your card back. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I picked up the medication today at Bimart, so we have it here in the house. Goodbye. In Oregon, where it's been legal for 17 years, more than a third of patients who obtain the drugs never take them. But more than 850 people have taken their lives, including 29-year-old Brittany Menard, who had brain cancer. Brittany wanted to choose when she died, so she was forced to leave California and move to Oregon, where a doctor could then legally prescribe medication that would end her life. Before she died last November, Brittany reached out to Barbara Coombs Lee, who now runs an advocacy organization, Compassion and Choices. They made a video that was seen by millions. I will die upstairs in my bedroom that I share with my husband, um, with my mother and my husband by my side, and pass peacefully with some music that I like in the background. She wanted to be an advocate and she wanted to do whatever she could with her remaining time to help campaign to make this available to other people in every state. Brittany Menard's story reignited debate as California becomes the 14th state to take steps toward right to die legislation. People are calling us every day saying, I want to introduce a Brittany bill. Hi there. Dr. Quill is also still pushing for change. We don't have answers for every kind of suffering. There have always been hard cases. There will always be hard cases. He recently joined a new lawsuit asking New York State not to prosecute doctors who help suffering patients end their lives. We believe that terminally ill patients should have the right to request this kind of assistance. As for Michael Morosco, he made the decision to stop eating and drinking. Dr. Quill kept him comfortable in the hospital as he passed away. 